We are in the book of 2 Thessalonians, so I'd encourage you to grab your Bibles and go there. We've been walking slowly, very carefully, very intentionally through this book. For about two months now we've been, and we're just now kind of cracking into chapter two. So uh, that's kind of the, the pace we're going, but we want to be faithful to God's Word. And we want to see in a book that's not often explored. It's not a, not a very popular book, if you can call books of the Bible popular or not. Uh, but we want to... We want to Stick to this, and I want to I see what is hidden, what's, what's some hidden gems in this book for us. So we're always going to keep in mind as we walk through this book, the two goals that Paul has as he writes. The first goal is to encourage believers who are being persecuted. He wants to go into these faithful Christians who are enduring just tremendous persecution. He wants to be an encouragement to them, and we've seen that through chapter 1. But then the second thing he's going to do is he's going to clear up confusion about Christ's return about his second coming. So there was a lot of confusion in the church about when Christ was going to return or what it was going to be like, what it was going to look like. And so Paul is just trying to clear up some of that uh, confusion. So chapter 1 was a lot about hope. It was a lot about comfort and patience for these people. Chapter 2 is a lot more about eschatology. It's an important word for us to learn. Eschatology means the doctrine of the end times. So we spent, I don't know how many how many weeks in Revelation. We remember 30 six, 37 weeks in Revelation. That's kind of where we were talking about. So it's kind of exciting to go back into it and dip my toes back into it. Uh, but we looked last week, we kind of just introduced this idea of a major figure that appears in, in, this, in the return of Christ or around the time of the return of Christ, and that's the man of lawlessness. Now who, we may disagree on different things, but who, uh, who at least from my perspective, who is this guy? It's the beast of Revelation or... The Antichrist. It is it is Satan's man uh, that he puts on the scene. So we're going to talk a little bit more about him. We're going to look at what his what his character is like. Who is this guy that comes on the scene? And we talked about this a little bit when I preached through Revelation 13 last year. But this is one of the most popular kind of areas of Christianity to explore. There's been so many people throughout the years who have tried to say that's the Antichrist. I don't, I don't know, is this uh, something you've seen, but like I've seen over and over and over trying to say, well, this person's the Antichrist. It almost seems like every major political figure that rises up is the Antichrist. At some point for somebody, it's, it's them, it's got to be them. I remember without a doubt people would say, that, like just during my lifetime, people were saying, you know, Obama is the, is the Antichrist. And then I heard the, the same about Trump. Trump is the Antichrist. And we heard all of these different things. And I remember, I think I said it in there when we preached through this, but it, it seems like you'd be probably just as accurate to just to walk somewhere and point at someone and say, that person's just as likely to be uh, the Antichrist as any of these major figures that are uh, coming on the scene. Uh, but we, we kind of mentioned this man a couple of weeks ago, and I want to go a little further into who this kind of mysterious individual is. So we're going to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. That's where we're going to be tonight. Really, I just want to kind of look at the events surrounding his, his coming and, and look at kind of his character and what he is marked by. And so, in, in your, well, well, we'll explain once we read, but let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It says this, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. Significant, significant passage for us. It tells us a lot about who this person is going to be. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and then we will look at, look at some different things surrounding just this, this introduction of who this guy is. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. You are so good to us. You're gracious and wonderful and loving and merciful. We are in awe of who you are, Lord, that the, the God of all creation would stoop so low as to meet with us, to meet with us and desire a relationship with us. Lord, you amaze me. And I'm grateful for this opportunity that we get to know you through your word. Lord, this, as we read about this, this Antichrist, this beast, this man of lawlessness, Lord, there's so much here that, that could produce fear in us because of this man, but we know ultimately that you are in sovereign control, that there's nothing to fear, there's no anxiety to be had, because you are on your throne, 
now and you will be in the future. And this man poses no threat to your kingdom or your mission or your purpose in this place. And so I pray, thanking you for that kind of trust and that kind of peace that we can have as we walk through this text. We love you and we thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I, don't, I, I didn't intend in my notes to talk about this, but um, if you look back through church history as well, there's been a lot of different interpretations of who this person is. Uh, for most of church history, at least from the kind of the reformers and the Puritans on, they believed that the, the Pope or the, the, the papal system, the, the Catholic Church, was the Antichrist. It only was like in the mid 1800s that the kind of the, the idea started to come about that he was a specific individual that was going to be born and, and going to uh, create uh, chaos and controversy. And so uh, times have changed and theology has kind of changed to match that. And so I, I don't, I, I want to look and be careful about theology. We talked about all the way through the book of Revelation that we can disagree on almost every one of those points. There's, there's, there's no point in there except for the fact that Christ will return, he will judge this world, and he will sit on an eternal glorious throne. We can agree on those things, but almost everything else, we can have some leeway. But So I, I want to walk through, and I'm going to walk through with this assumption that this man is a real man. He's a real individual person. He will come on the scene. I don't, I don't know if during my lifetime, or, or I, I don't know if a believer will ever fully realize who he is. Because I believe that by the time he reveals his true self, I believe that believers have, will have been caught up uh, and be raptured and be in heaven with the Lord. So a lot of this discussion is really for those who are here and those who are left and, and just for the idea of knowledge's sake and then also to fully recognize that this man is going to come on the scene and his, and his tenure is going to be very brief. And so uh, that's what I want. But I want to unpack this tonight. We're going to explore the, the character of the Antichrist through five adjectives that describe him in the text. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I, I've, I've kind of revealed to you and I've talked to you a lot about the way that I write my outlines. Um, I'm real finicky about it and I'm not good at it. So it, it, it always is a little different each time that we gather together. But they call him the man of lawlessness. So I wanted to run with that kind of a, a literary theme. And so all of the answers tonight, all the blanks tonight, are going to end with esness. Okay? <laughs> So something isness, so lawlessness, and, and, a, and a few others. So that's that's why I, I I didn't intend for you to have to write out sixteen letter words, uh, but this is the way that it happened, and so enjoy. Um, and I don't even have them on the screen, so you just have to figure out how to spell it if you need uh, to do that. But so I want to look at it in, in a couple of different ways. And really, what I want to do is we walk through. I don't want to focus, and I don't want to kind of pinpoint and, and put all our our focus on this man. I think it's a fruitless discussion. To look at this person who is doomed to destruction. And so instead what I want to do, I want to draw our attention mainly to who Christ is in comparison to this guy. Because this guy's going to come on the scene and he's going to be gone, but Christ is eternal. And so I want to kind of look at the, the difference between the two. So the first one I want to look at is this, faithlessness. Faithlessness. There's a lot of letters, I know. But it says in verse 3, so talking faithlessness, it says in verse 3, Let's see, going back to chapter 2. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come. So talking about the day of the Lord. Christ's return will not come unless what comes first? Apostasy. Apostasy. What is your, do your does anybody's version say something different than apostasy? Falling away. Rebellion. Falling away, rebellion. That's, that's really the, the three main ones that we see. So that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Apostasy is not a word we use a whole lot in, uh, in modern English, but it is, a, it is a theme that comes up very, very frequently. What does it mean? They used to use it in the Mormon church a lot. Okay, so what would it mean in, in context of the Mormon well, church? I'm not Mormon. That's no, that's okay, that's okay. I remember they Pointing fingers. people that did not, think, did not believe in what they believed Good. in is apost an apostate yeah. and they needed to be gotten rid of. Good, okay. They used to have soldiers that actually went and did that. Wow. So, so yeah, and, and, and you're, you're hitting on it, and even the words that we use are, are really kind of describing it. Typically, the word apostasy, what it means is somebody who was something and, and is something no longer. So if they were a Mormon and they fell away from the church, that would be an apostate. We would consider this the same if a person... Now, that's some heavy language. When, when we talk about a person, because we all know people in this room, or not in this room, but in this room, we all know people who were here or were part of the church and have walked away. 
we're not going to label people apostates. We, we can maybe think it, but we probably shouldn't say it out loud because that's, that's a heavy word, the apostasy. So when this talks about the apostasy coming first, this is the Greek word apostasia, which means to fall away or to forsake. It comes from this, and I'm, I'm not a, I don't, I don't like to keep pulling Greek into it, but I, this is, is really significant. When it comes, when you look at the root word of that, it's apostasion, which means divorce. And so it's an interesting thing when you trace that back. What this is saying is somebody who leaves, like a, like a spouse, leave, like a husband leaves her wife, or his wife, and, or, or a wife leaves her husband in the same way. A person who walks away from the Lord is this what this is describing here. And this is just setting the stage. So the Antichrist is going to come on the scene in a great falling away from Christianity, a great falling away from the church. So there's going to be a massive movement to step away from Christ and to, to step away from the church. I think that's pretty significant because that's pretty indicative of who this man is. His ministry is built on drawing people away from the Lord and toward himself. Church, I have a sneaking suspicion in my heart that we may be here right now. I think we may be at the beginning of what we would call the great apostasy. I've seen study after study after study talking about why people aren't going to church anymore. I'm sure you've seen those studies, you've seen those graphs like, well man, in the 1950s, like, you know, 80% of people in America were Christian, and then every decade it goes down and down and down and down. And there's going to be a point when we look back and say we are no longer a Christian nation. I, I, don't, I don't know where that point is. I don't know where that percentage is. Even if a person calls themselves a Christian, I, I don't know what that really means in terms of a, a, a faithful relationship with Christ. But I think we may be, I think we may be here. And this is a point where I want to very confidently say this isn't something to fear, though. Uh, and I think it, it bothers people and say, well, people are falling away from the church. Well, I, I think at the same time, we're, what, what is happening is that there is, I think we can look at it as instead of a falling away from the church, maybe a revealing of who the real church is. Kind of a, a purification of who the church really is. And so as, you, as we look at this, as believers in Christ, we've got nothing to fear. People will fall away. But remember, the, the message of 2 Thessalonians is stand firm. Stand firm in the midst of persecution. Stand firm. Even if, I mean, we sing that song, if no one follows, or yet still I will follow, right? Or, or if none go with me, still I will follow. And so we're looking at this, this kind of idea, this Antichrist, he's marked by faithlessness. He comes on this, the, the wings of, of a time period when people are falling away from the Lord. But what about Jesus? What about the focus of our faith? How does Jesus compare? He is the very embodiment of faithfulness. When you think of what faithfulness means, usually we use that word when we talk about our, our spouse. We're faithful to, to our spouse. There is no one more faithful than Jesus. He's our pattern. He's our example. One of the greatest verses, I think, to comfort us in this is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That is who he intrinsically is. He is faithful to his people and he is faithful to his Father. So in light of who Christ is and who the Antichrist is, the church then in response, we've got to be faithful. We've got to be found faithful. And that's kind of the idea that you see throughout the New Testament. When Christ returns, will his people be found faithful? faithful. And so I, I like that. When I was a kid, I don't know about you, but uh, rapture fever was, was really, really high. And we, everybody was talking about the rapture. And one of the things that kept getting brought up in kids ministry and, and uh, youth ministry and different things was, where will you be or what will you be doing when Christ returns? Do you remember that? And then, so when I was a teenager, there was times I was a, a little bit afraid, like, am I allowed to do anything? Am I allowed to, like, am I allowed to eat? Because what if Christ returns and I'm eating? Like, that's, that's not awesome. I want to I be, like, preaching, or I want to do something amazing. But, um, but we can do that. It, whatever, whatsoever you do, whether it's eating or drinking, do it all to the glory of God. But here's the thing. It, when you look at this, so the Antichrist is marked by faithlessness, but God's people, as we follow the pattern of our Savior, should be marked by faithfulness. So faithlessness is number one. Let's keep moving. Number two, lawlessness. And that's drawn right out of the text there. So if you need to see the spelling of that, you can just look at your Bible right there. So the day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man of lawlessness is revealed. 
I, I said I wouldn't do much Greek, but tonight there's so much here. There's so much really cool stuff to pull out of the text. I want you to see some, some cool connections here. The first thing is, he's a man. He's a man. We tend, when we read the book of Revelation, and when we read this, to ascribe him some kind of supernatural status, like he is some kind of uh, incredible being of power and of might, and nobody can stand against him. And in fact, when he comes on the scene, the people look at him and say, who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war against him? We see this moment that he is a man. The, the, ver the word that they use here is anthropos, which means man, a human male. We do not need a biology degree to identify what is male and what is female. I don't know if you watched that interview, but that was the craziest thing that I had ever seen. Can you identify or can you describe what a female is or what a woman is? No, I don't have a biology degree. Ooh, I, I just sat there and I said, if, if it requires a biology degree, then there's some people that are in a whole lot of trouble. But... We don't, need the, we don't need a biology degree. We understand. He's a man. He, he's a man with all of the, the background of what that means to be a man. He may be empowered by Satan, and we know that he is, but he is just a man. Now, I want to be careful as we, as we compare, because I think maybe not overtly, but kind of in the background, we've kind of ascribed to him... Even Hollywood has participated in this. When you read, when you watch movies like The Omen and and um, you know some of those some of those kind of movies, that they kind of talk about him as a son of Satan, and we almost kind of look at him like he is Satan made flesh. And I want to be very clear that he is not the the, the dark counterpart part of Christ, where Christ was God Himself come down in human flesh. He he was he was. The Spirit of God, or He was the Son, the eternal Son of God, and He took on flesh and became human. That's not the case for the Antichrist. He is not Satan turned into a human being. He is a human being given power by Satan. And so, uh, one of the one of the greatest songs that we sing at Christmas uh, is called "Hark the Herald Angels Sing." It, it, you know, I know we're not in Christmas, and you're like, it's getting warmer, so you can't talk about Christmas. But I walked out this morning, and it was a little humid, and that was the first glimpse of. East Texas summer humidity in it. it. I didn't love that. But, um, but when you look at this, one of the greatest theological statements is in that song, and, and we sing it about Christ. It says, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead, see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as God with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. That is, that's Christ. He became man. He was God himself who became man, but the same is not true about the Antichrist. He is, he is not the devil incarnate. He's a pale imitation of who Christ is. He is absolutely limited by his humanity and his mortality. Christ came and he had no limitations. This man does. I, were you the one that said it, or was it Wade when talking about how there's one raised up in every generation? That some people believe there's one in every generation raised and ready to go for. I've talked about that, and and I and I do I do believe it. I think because no man knows the day or the hour of Christ's okay. return. I think Satan has always had to be ready. He's yeah. always had to have somebody. Whether or not he's trying to fulfill prophecy, I doubt that that's the reason. I think he's always tried to raise up a man to challenge. God and his work in this world. And so I, I think we've seen it. I mean, you even see it all the way throughout Scripture. I believe that he empowered or influenced Cain to kill his brother. I think he, he did the same with uh, the, the Pharaoh killing the, the Israelite boys. I think he did the same with Haman trying to destroy the, the Israelites in the book of Esther. I think he's done this over and over and over. I think he inspires people to work against the people of God. But I do believe he is raised up. Just like Christ was promised in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would crush the, the head of the serpent, I think he has tried to raise up his own seed uh, throughout the, the, the generations. But again and again and again, it's been, he's been thwarted by God's <clears throat> ultimate plan. So, yeah, I do, I do think he is ready at any given moment. And, and I, I firmly believe, I think we are, either in my lifetime or, or the lifetime of my daughter Chloe, I think we will, I think we will see the end of all things. I think we are we are that close to the the prophetic end, and so I believe he's alive today. He may he may be living in a you know in a he may be in a nursery right now. He may be a little boy, but um, I I don't I, I don't know. I, I I think, but again, that's not scripture. That's that this. But we do know this. He's a man, so he's going to be born. He's going to grow up in a in, in a family or or somewhere. He's going to grow up and he's going to become a man and all the things that that means. So it calls him the man of lawlessness. So let's talk about lawlessness. It's the word anomia. 
when you, in Greek and in English, when you add the prefix a to something, it turns it into a negative. And so we'll talk about it like this. Uh, if, if somebody is moral, that usually means good. They're, they're upstanding. They follow the rules. But a person who is amoral or amoral, what would that mean? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 it kind of turns it into a whole new word. It makes it the opposite of this. So that's what we're seeing here. The word nomos is law, and they add that prefix a to it. So he is a man without law. He has, he has no law. Uh, I've heard it said that you can describe this as a man who is a law unto himself, that he doesn't follow the laws of God or the laws of man. You could call him a law breaker. Instead, he's, he's lawless, he's law unto himself. Daniel 11.36 talks about the Antichrist, and this is how he describes him. The king who does whatever he wants. And I think that's a really unique indication of this man is not governed by any fear of God, and he's not governed by any fear of man. He operates in, in whatever capacity that he wants. I saw a question posed on, on TikTok the other day, okay? And this is the question. What if for the next 20 minutes, nothing that you did would you be punished for? What if you could just give in to your impulses completely? You could do whatever you wanted, and there would be no consequences to it. So anybody, people, anyway, people were talking about, it's kind of like the basis, of, it, it, please don't see it, but the, the movie, the Purge movies, uh, this idea of, hey, no rules, no law, what do you do in that moment? And the, the answers that people were given almost always gave in to like, our, our base instincts. Like, I would rob a store, uh, I would do this, I would take as much as I would want, I would do whatever I wanted with there's, because there's no consequences. And this is how this man lives his life. This man comes on the scene, he's like, there are no consequences to, to my decisions and my actions. When he comes, it will be chaos and it will be disorder, even though outwardly he's going to bring peace. And that's, as we talked about in the book of Revelation, I believe in the aftermath of the rapture, there is going to be chaos. And this man is going to come on the scene and take control. But there's a big difference between control and peace. And so we're going to, we're going to kind of see, he's going to outwardly bring peace. But everything he touches is chaos and it's disorder. He's a man without law. And then the last thing I want you to see here, uh, it says that he is the man, it says the man of lawlessness is revealed. That word revealed is the word apocalypto, which is the Greek word, uh, the Greek name of the book of Revelation. And so that's kind of an interesting connection there. We're connecting all these points. This is all interconnected with the end times and what's going to happen in, in the book of Revelation. Where is Jesus in the midst of this? Because you see a man like this who wields almost unilateral power. He's got no checks on his authority. He, he wins this world, though the world worships him. He, he does not follow law. So, like, where is Jesus? Because in the midst of that, that can kind of seem like this guy's got a lot of power, and Jesus is, like, where is Jesus? Well, I want you to see some, some very significant things about Christ in his, as he's contrasted with him. So this is the man of lawlessness, but Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the law. When he came, he intended to be perfect in fulfilling every single one of the points of the law. Brownie points today, spiritual points that you can win and, and redeem in heaven. How many laws are there in the Old Testament? 630. 613. 613. 613. 613. That's it right there. 613. 613 laws. So, you guys, can, you guys can parcel it up in eternity. You can, I mean, it's 10,000 points. Just... <laughs> Earn that in return. It goes into extra commandments, okay? So, they're so yeah. So, but 613 laws. That's overwhelming. And we, we've seen this over and over. We talk about this. The point of the law was that man cannot keep the law. He cannot perfectly keep the law of God. If he's broken one point of the law, he's broken all the points of the law. We can't even keep the ten. The, the, the ten that kind of reduced it all down. I'll even go further. Jesus reduced it down to two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And love your neighbor as you We can't even do that. We can't even comp complete the two. But Christ, as he walked on earth, completed all 613 without fail. He was, he was perfect in this. He was not a man of, of lawlessness. When he came, it was, it was unity and it was peace and it was order. He says in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. And his perfect obedience enables the church to perfectly obey. Now, 
I say perfectly obey. We will obey perfectly one day in glory. Right now our, our obedience is subject to our sin just like every other part of us. But he, his, his perfect obedience enables us to faithfully follow Him all the days of our lives and obey Him faithfully. So this, this man is marked by... Um, he is marked by faithlessness. He's marked by lawlessness. Number three, he's marked by lifelessness. Lifelessness. So in verse three it says, The day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. The man doomed to destruction. The original text uh, reads this as the son of destruction. So that's, that's how they, that they uh, look at him. Only one other person in the Bible is called the son of destruction. I want to see if anybody is. John, I need to finish the question. Come on, John. And he had it. Just two seconds. <laughs> two seconds. No, that it is. It's Judas Iscariot is the only other person called the son of destruction. John 17, 12, Jesus said, While I was with them, talking about the disciples, I was protecting them by your name that you've given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost except the son of destruction so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. The son of destruction, my version says the man doomed to destruction. Does anybody else have anything different? Perdition. Perdition, and that's the same. Again, we don't, it's not words that we commonly use, but it means the same thing. When he talks about destruction, it's not talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual destruction. Otherwise, this text re refers to all of us. If we're, if we're talking about being doomed to destruction, if this is just physical destruction, all of us are, are doomed to destruction. At some point, our physical bodies will be destroyed. But this is talking about eternal damnation. Jesus uses this word in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. So every unbeliever is headed toward this same destruction, but the Antichrist is unique. He is literally labeled son of destruction what is a let's let's talk about that in in that world that this was written in the son especially a firstborn son what would he stand to inherit the kingdom yeah, all, all, all that his father had his, the kingdom of his father all the goods of his father so when somebody is called the son of destruction that I mean that's very pointed in this time frame he's talking you are going to inherit everything that hell and damnation have to offer that will be on his head. He'll receive destruction as his inheritance. It is literally in his blood. There is no life in him. He's doomed from the beginning. And again, I want you to see in the opposite in Jesus Christ. We can't, people are going to put their, their hope in this man, but eventually he's, he's going to be destroyed. We're going to read that next week in 2 Thessalonians 5 through 12. It's going to talk about Jesus destroying him with the breath of his mouth. But look at the opposite in Jesus. He not only is the author of life, he gives life, but in him is life itself. We exist because of who he is. John 1, 3, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And then Jesus famously goes on in John 14, 6 to say, I am the way, the truth, and what? The life. the life. So his encouragement to the church is to faithfully take hold of both the, the eternal and the abundant life that Jesus offers us. I, I, I hope you see what I'm doing here. We're looking at the Antichrist, but he, he's going to fail people, and he's going to fail this world at every single step. But when you put your faith in Christ, you will not. So number four is this. He's marked by shamelessness. Shamelessness. Let's move into, into verse 4. Shamelessness. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. It takes a man with no shame and no sense of humility to proclaim himself to be a God and demand to be worshipped. This is, I mean, this is very significant. I know that there are many, many people who, who like admiration and they like people looking up to them, but that's something, that's in a whole different universe here. This man is saying, I am above every god. So he's going to stand in places where they worship uh, Allah and, 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 and revere Muhammad. He's going to say, I am above your god. He's going to stand in places where they, they worship all these different deities, and he's going to say, I, I am above that, and I deserve all of this worship. This is literally the first commandment. The first commandment, have no other gods 
before me. And in his pride and arrogance and shamelessness, he's going to come on the scene and say, I am the God that goes before you. You're going to worship me because I'm going to bring you peace in this world of disorder. Daniel 8.25 says, in his own mind, he will exalt himself. So this is not just outward, it's inward as well. He fully believes that he is a God and deserves to be worshipped. And then Daniel 11.36 says, he will exalt and magnify himself above every God. I mean, you, and, and I don't think people are going to see this at the beginning. I really don't. I think they're going to see a man who comes on the scene and brings order and, and signs peace treaties, and, he, and we're going to see all these good things, and I think it's only going to be later on that he's going to reveal who he really is, that he doesn't just want to be a good man doing good things, but he wants to receive worship from people and steal worship um, from from all over this, this world. But again, in Jesus, when we focus on Jesus, we see the opposite. We don't, see, we don't see a person like this. Now, Jesus, could he have come on the scene and demanded worship? Absolutely. He could have come on the scene everywhere. He could have, wherever he was, in every marketplace, in every synagogue, in every city, in every place he went, he could have said, bow down and worship me. And, and, and one day we will. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But when he lived on this earth, we see the opposite. We see true humility, faithfulness, and obedience. In John 17, 4, he tells the Lord in his high priestly prayer, he says, I have glorified you on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Jesus, the, the one who deserves all worship, said, Lord, I am here for your glory. I am here so that you would be magnified in what I do the encouragement to the church is this, don't glorify yourself. Don't boast in yourself. Don't look for those kind of things because those kind of things are so temporary. Give all the glory to God. It doesn't matter how good things are in the church. And this is a, this is a significant thing. And I'm seeing it all over the place, this idea that if a church grows a lot, then they feel like they need to go out and tell everybody else how they grew. Well, let me, let me just give you all the, the examples and all the wonderful things. And this is, this is how, you, if you repeat these processes, then you can become the church like, like we are. Listen, a church only grows because of a couple of reasons. Either the Spirit of God is moving in the hearts of people and, and the church multiplies disciples, or people want to have their ears tickled and they gather together in a place where, where they can do that. And we're a place where, where, where nothing, nothing negative is ever said. No matter how good things are going in your life or in the church, everything we have is because of the grace of a sovereign God. Everything that we have, everything that you have in the bank, everything that you have in the tank of your car right now. Are you guys praying right now that God would multiply that gas like, like Elijah multiplied the oil? <laughs> you know, every day I'm like, well, I got a quarter of a tank. I think I could probably make this last three or four weeks if I just, you know, just don't, don't drive very much. But everything that we have is, is his. He gave it to us temporarily. We give him glory always in everything. We never seek that for ourselves. The last thing I want to talk about is this. This, this Antichrist, this man of lawlessness, he's marked by godlessness. Godlessness. It goes beyond just saying, I am above all gods. Look at what he does here in the end of verse 4. He opposes and he exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship. And here's the, the clincher. So that he sits in God's temple, proclaiming that he himself is God. And I want you to see something significant, because if you look in your text, the first part of verse 4 is little g. It's all, it's all little g. And he's exalting himself above all the little g gods. But then here at the end of verse 4, he is proclaiming that he himself is big g God. He's saying, I am. I am. This is, this is dangerous. This is confirmed all the way throughout Old Testament prophecy as well. The, the coming of this, of this man. Let me read you a few verses. Matthew 24, 15. Jesus said this. You will see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. So Jesus himself knew this man would stand in the holy place of the temple. Daniel 7, 25. He will speak words against the Most High. Daniel eleven thirty six. He will say outrageous things against the God of gods. Daniel 11.37, he will not show regard for the gods of his fathers, the God desired by women or for any other god, because he will magnify himself above all. 
He longs to be worshipped as a god. He longs to come on the scene and, and he, he stands in the temple itself and demands people's worship. And he will relentlessly persecute those who, who refuse. Can you imagine the audacity of someone to do something like this? Now, priests in the Old Testament, they came into the temple and they came into the tabernacle, I mean, with fear and trembling. They approached that innermost sanctuary, the most holy place, with absolute fear. One person, one time a year, could enter behind that curtain. That was the high priest on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He could enter in one time. And they, they were so fearful and so reverent for God's holiness and his, and his wrath in that moment, they would tie a, a rope around his foot with bells on it so that if he went in there and was struck dead... The other priests could pull him up. I guarantee you that rope was like 150 feet long, too. I guarantee you they're not 10 feet away. They're, they're down the street. They're like, he's going in there. I don't want anything to do because God proves himself holy. When, when Nadab and Abihu brought strange fire before the Lord, it says the earth opened up and consumed them. When, 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 uh, when uh, Uzzah reached and touched the ark of God just to stabilize it and to steady it, God struck him dead. You see this over and over and over in the Old Testament, this idea of, of the, the sovereignty and the, the blazing holiness of God and people standing in fear and reverence before this God. And this man stands in the most holy place in the sanctuary, in the, in the tabernacle, in the temple, and says, I deserve to stand in this place and I deserve the worship that comes into this place. This is, this is I mean, I, I, I don't even know what to say about the, the, the audacity, the godlessness of standing in this place and doing that. You grew up, I, don't know, I know I did too, but in this, I, in this world where when you came into the church, this was a, this was a, 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 we called this the house of God. And when I would do things that were bad, that was the first thing. This is God's house. You don't do those things in God's house. I remember one of the times my dad was preaching on a Sunday night and I had a brand new girlfriend. And I, I was 10. I mean, whatever kind of girlfriend you can have at age 10. But in the middle of the service, I put my arm around her. <laughs> and my dad, he, he didn't stop. He just, and, and he always moved around like I do. So he was walking around and, and he stepped down and he started walking down the aisle. And I thought he was doing some kind of illustration. And then I realized he was making a beeline for me. And he, <laughs> I was terrified. I was like, I don't know, what, I don't, I'm going to die. I guess I'm going to die. But at least I have all these witnesses right here so they can see. But he came and he grabbed my arm. And he put it down by my side, and he separated us, and then he walked right back up to the pulpit. He never stopped preaching. He just kept going and going. And afterwards, I, I really that's when I really got um, just in tune with, um, with the Lord in that moment, because I thought I was going to die. Um, but I, he talked to me, and he's like, this is the church. This, this is the place. That we, inherently, we have this idea, and, and we understand that the church is not the building, but we have a sense of sacredness about what we're doing in this place and, and why we're here to meet with the God of all creation and, and even it, it just in our daily lives to meet with him. But in this sense here, he stands in the temple and he says, no, God doesn't deserve worship. I do. This is a, a, a scary thing. He's absolutely godless. And next week we will see God's wrath poured out on him. You cannot live in such open, defiant rebellion and expect there not to be consequences. So where is Jesus? And I think this is really significant as you look at him. Jesus is not sitting in the temple because he is the temple. Now, in the beginning, we, we do see him sitting and, and, and asking the teachers and asking questions in the temple, but we know that he is the temple. John 2, 19 through 22, Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. And the Jews said, This temple took 46 years to build. You're going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the statement that Jesus had made. So Jesus didn't, he, he didn't need to stand in the temple and proclaim himself God, because he, he himself is the temple. He himself is the place where we meet, where sinful people meet with a holy God. Also, he didn't have to go around proclaiming himself to be God. And in fact, we often don't see that. In the New Testament, uh, this idea of him, him walking around everywhere and declaring who he is uh, because he demonstrates it. 
He doesn't have to say it because he demonstrates. He demonstrated in homes and marketplaces and synagogues and street corners. He proved his authority over death and disease and demons. In fact, everywhere he went, he was rightly identified by demons. I think that is one of the, one of the craziest things when you look. It took people, even his own disciples, a long time to recognize who he was. It took, it took Peter a while before he got to the point where he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But everywhere he went, it says in Mark 3.11, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the Son of God. Jesus didn't have to proclaim anything. He is the Son of God, the, the sovereign king of this universe. And Paul's encouragement to the church is, in light of all that, do not put your faith in this man that's going to come on the scene. Put your faith in Christ alone. So this is... I'm finished for tonight. This is just part one of this, this idea, this man of lawlessness doomed to destruction. Next week we're going to expand these ideas and we're going to talk about what he actually does. What, he, what he's going to do, what are his works going to be. But praise God for the believer, none of this, none of this should cause us worry. None of this should cause us concern. We should never be in a moment wondering who it is and, 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 and fear, living in fear of who this guy is because ultimately he is doomed to destruction. He's going to come on the scene. He's going to flare up. His, his time on earth is going to be brief and explosive, and he is going to be among the first people ever cast into hell. And so as, as, as the church of Jesus Christ, we look and say, even if the world around us falls away, let's be faithful to him. Even if we're persecuted when we don't believe in men like this, we can be steadfast through the midst of, uh, of all of this. And we can be patient as we wait for Christ to return. Church, let's pray. Any, any comments, questions, or snide remarks, I'll take them all. That's why I took, uh, we did those two songs. That's right. Mm -hmm. As long as we trust in Jesus, we're going to have peace and joy. That's right. That's awesome. I love that, Barry. Thank you for that. No, we, should, we should trust and obey. <laughs> First and the only way. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus. Trust, trust and obey. That's right. All right, anybody else? All right, let's jump to him in prayer. Father, we thank you for the, the sweet assurance that Lord, when we have you, we have everything. When we are joined to you through Christ Jesus, we have nothing to fear. There is nothing in this world that could, that could take us away from you. You've promised us incredible, incredible blessings through Christ. You've promised us the presence of the Holy Spirit to encourage us and comfort us and equip us. You've promised us your work of sanctification to make us more like you. You've promised us grace and strength and endurance through, through trials. You've promised us ultimately on the other side of this life an eternal home and, and an eternal welcome to be with you forever. Lord, I, I thank you so much for that. And I pray as the church, no matter what comes our way, we would put our faith in Christ Jesus. I thank you so much, Lord, for his work in our lives, his, his love and devotion to his people, his work of building the church. I'm so grateful, Lord, to to him and to you for what you have done for your people. And I pray that we would spend our lives in praise and in, uh, Lord, pursuit of who you are and what you want from us. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.